Hello and welcome to episode 38 of Take Your Points. I'm your host, Ronan Scott. This week's show, we're looking back at Cavan's Ulster Championship victory over Donegal. Uh, a shock result to pretty much everyone in Ulster and in Ireland. But it's an incredible result for Ulster and for Ulster GA. Um, so this week, we've got Jordan Keane in chatting about that victory. Also on our show, we've got Ryan McMenamin and Brian Wigan both talking about their mentor, Mickey Hart, who has decided to move on from Throne and go to Live. And Shane Elliott's with us as well to talk about the uh, upcoming uh, All Ireland uh, Championship semi finals. And he also has a few things to say about Antrim uh, down in Donegal and their, how they're faring in this year's championship. So I'd like to welcome Jordo Keen to this week's show. Um, Jordan, thanks for joining us. Uh, but we wanted to get you on to talk about the Ulster final. Cavan's incredible win over Donegal. Um, so just to start, um, what do you think the key was to Cavan's victory in the Ulster final? There have been a number of different factors you could fire in. Uh, I think it's unfair in Cavan to say that their victory was built on heart and desire and that sort of thing, which is hard to measure because... They're a really good team, full of good footballers as well. And, of course, to beat Donegal, they had to match him for that desire and the world he won and all that sort of good stuff. But once they matched him at that level, they certainly weren't going to win if they didn't have footballers who were capable of either defending, playing midfield, taking their scores, one on their own ball. And all that stuff come together just made the perfect storm for them. Uh, I think one of the key things was that Kavanagh fit to play in two or three different ways even during a game so whenever say Hugh McFadden was dropping back Cavan maybe had Martin Dunn on the full forward line meant the ball get in wasn't big high ball it was more patient worked through the hands they weren't kicking in the first time ball and it made Hugh McFadden's role a bit redundant and then wherever maybe Hugh McFadden was pushing out they were fit to play Galligan in the full forward line and Cavan have been playing route one football for some or parts of their game on all the games so far and I think that route one football then was definitely a, an extra string to their bow but the fact that they're fit to change it up mid-game keep all their teams guessing keep them on their toes I think it makes it very hard for likes of Donegal to play against even though if you matched up the two sets of players you might say that Donegal probably have the better squad if they were to play 10 times Donegal might won seven of them, Cavan three, and I don't think that's been too disrespectful to Cavan, but on this occasion, only had they won once to win the Ulster final, and that's what they've done. This is probably an obvious one, but what was the most memorable moment for you in the game? I suppose I don't want to be too cliched about it, but it probably has to be the goal, which Cavan scored towards the end. Uh, there was only 67 minutes on the clock, and there's only a point in it, so I think if Sean Patton catches that, he starts another attack for Donegal and Donegal are well capable of going up the field, holding the ball, working the score. Uh, they nearly fashioned a goal after it. They had two points from the exact same position, both that drifted wide as well. So they did have chances, but I think then once they went four down, it was more a bit panic, more gung-ho than we used to see from Donegal. And I think because of that, the goal has to be the major, major incident in the game now. That's not to say that the game wasn't exciting from all respects. Uh, there was the, the save that Gallagher made in the 62nd minute from Jamie Brennan was a massive moment because if Donegal score that to go two up, again, they might close the game out. But that's all ifs and buts at this stage. What will it mean for Cavan? How will it affect the future for the football in the county? I suppose you only have to see the, like, the emotional scenes after the game were brought out in Mickey Graham and Raymond Gallagher and the celebrations now I know them sort of celebrations are part and partial for most teams that won but for a county like Cavan who haven't won an Ulster in 23 years and before that it was back in the 70s so you're only talking two inside 50 years it's a massive fill up for them uh, it moves them on to number 40 streaks ahead of anyone in the Ulster County Rule of Honour but I think they'll admit themselves that the last 50 years have they've been starved of that sort of success and it's amazing that what what that can do for the county going forward as a as a young person I can remember when Derry won the Ulster title in 98 I was 14 and for Cavan people now 
not having won it in 23 years, anybody under the age of probably 27, 28, this is a first for them in terms of how they remember it and all that sort of thing. So it can be massive also from the belief point of view from the players. So if you look at St. Pat's Cab and one of McCrory in 2015, uh, the current squad has an Ulster Minor one on team and they have a mixture of guys who won four under 20 titles from around the 2010. So they have nearly three generations of teams maybe mixed in together there. So I would say the belief that will give them players will be massive now. They'll need all that and more in the short term given they have Dublin now in less than two weeks. Uh, I suppose if you're comparing like for like are Cavan really any better than Meath? And your answer is probably no, they're not. And you're looking at what Dublin done to Meath at the weekend. But I think that can be maybe a Leinster Championship thing. It can be a psychological bar buyer for players in Leinster. Meeting Dublin year in, year out at that level. And producing the same results. I'm not saying Cavan's going to go to Dublin and have a cut at them and do run them close. But that wee bit of belief in terms of, well, they've only played Dublin once in the last three or four years since this Dublin team came about. So they probably don't have the mental hang-up that, that the likes of a, uh, a Meath or a Kildare would have, who's at a similar level to Cavan. So just might give them a wee boost in the arm. Longer term, the factor in Division 3 next year, I know Mickey Graham has stressed continuously that the league isn't what it's all about, but they'll want to bounce right back up and this will help give them, give them belief to do that. And finally, what does it mean for Donegal? I think that's quite a difficult one and I think it might have a bigger impact on Donegal than people might think. You know, they might just say, look, they had a bad day at the office, they didn't play that well. Uh, but I think Declan Bonner might be looking at it in that this is his third year in charge. They were going for three in a row. He's won the first two. However, it's also the third year in a row that they haven't made the All-Ireland semi-final. Uh, two previous years they went into the Super 8s as Ulster champions and didn't make it out of the group in both years. They have been to nine Ulster finals now in 10 years and out of that I gather they've only been to two all Ireland semi-finals or three sorry which is 2011, 2012 and 2014. So I'm sure they'll be questioning themselves in that regard. Uh, I don't think it'll be a case of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but it might be a case of them maybe looking, look, do we need to change something along the line here? Einstein says the definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. That's now three years in a row they haven't got to a semi-final, so they'll be definitely looking to make a change or a tweak somewhere. It might even have been a psychological block on Sunday. This year's been a different year with COVID, playing at a different time of the year and all that sort of stuff, but... I definitely think Donegal will do some soul search in the back of this. Jared, thanks for taking part. Our next guest is Ryan McMenamin, the legendary throne footballer and defender who won so much with Mickey Hart. Um, so I wanted to get him on to talk about Mickey, but I also wanted to ask him about his season as from a manager and what he hopes for next year. So Ryan, thanks for joining us this week. Um, just to start, how important was Mickey to throwing football? Yeah, look, um, Mickey sort of he's had a massive influence on throwing, and that's going back even to the to the nineties, and even probably going back to when he played as well. So, um, probably he probably took over throwing whenever we were probably maybe at a low ebb, and probably people thought what we had a low ebb, probably getting beaten two thousand and two against Sligo. Um, the one thing that he did do, and when he did come into the panel, he just made no he made no secret of it that he felt the players were as good as anything that was out there, even even the Kerrys, the Dublins at the stage, the Galways. And he probably felt maybe that that we shouldn't be selling ourselves short. And, and probably and it, it, once you're hearing that from a manager and probably once you've seen the drive and the passion that he came in, you know, you can only do but see just roll in behind him and get him behind him. And for us, it was massive at the stage. And like, we knew probably the legacy that he left. And, People look maybe at the All Irelands that he's won or whatever, but probably the bigger legacies that he has left probably after the eighteen years that throne has continually been talked as one of the All Ireland as one of the All Ireland challengers every year, not just maybe one or two years. We have been maybe for the past eighteen years just continually challenging, and we're one of we're up there now with the Kerry's Dublin's and. 
Galway's or and Mayo. So at as a nice and of fact, and probably that's a credit to Mickey. That's probably as his drive. You see other counties that come up and down through the years, but now for Throne and, and under Mickey is that there's been one constant, and that's been Throne always pushing for honour. So like you have to give that credit, and I think I think that's where the you have to say the greatest trait of the man is that he's always that he's kept Throne competitive. Maybe what they thought they shouldn't have been, but he's always kept them competitive, and he's always kept them pushing for honours, and and they've been close to a lot of honours. What did you learn from him? Yeah, what did I learn from Mickey? Um, <laughs> could uh, probably look see going with the season with Fermanagh there. Probably could have learned more, but no, probably one of the things, one of the always things that I've learned from Mickey is always, it was just always going forward, never probably look into the past of what's been done. And one of the things that. Even when he came into the throne, was um, he was always just always wa- always wanting to create history. Um, even with managing, he, even when you were speaking to him about see different stuff or even going on just for advice or whatever, it was one of the things that he had always preached was that um, you have to change, you have to you have to stay and you have to stay ahead of the game, and um, you have to be willing to admit maybe that the plans maybe you used maybe five six years ago or even two years ago, they might be the same as the plans that you use today and. It's one of the things just as he's always keen on was just constant evolution. So you had to just always look ahead and maybe it it mightn't seem right or it mightn't work right, but at the time if you really want to stay involved in coaching or whatever, um there's one thing that you you had to go with the times and whether maybe you mightn't have went with it ten years ago but you're going with it now, that's the way it is and um it's probably one of the reasons why he's probably stayed at the top so long. So that's probably one of the things that I've probably trying to take away from Mickey that I've learned from and um I don't know what it, it does stick with you even especially and I think it I think it rings true whenever you do get involved in management and you do probably see where the where that's coming from. At the start of the week um we were sort of wondering what Mickey was gonna do next but we know now what he's doing next. Um what did you think of that appointment? I think he's probably Planning the knock Dublin out of Leinster is probably his first thing anyway. So no, I think he's, I think he made it abundantly clear that he was that he still wasn't going to retire from from any sort of football. So no, to me it's no surprise knowing the hunger of the man and knowing knowing where he go and he's probably going to make a job of Louth. So he's um, no, I say his his next thing that he's going to win is probably win a Leinster with Louth. Finally, I wonder I wanted to ask you about uh, the season with Fermanagh. Um, what you thought of it? Um, perhaps a disappointment as you were relegated, but what you thought? of it this year and what do you hope for for next year yeah look um my hopes for for this for next season and coming in for the firman is probably one that we, we want it to be better than the season one past look i think we've all maybe since the defeat today we've all had a good hard look at ourselves no no more than the management team um we want it to see to see where we could get better and where could we where could we get the gains out of and we we looked you go back and look at all the games that we played and Apart from the Armagh game that we played, we were the only ever any other team. We were only a kick of a ball, or else we were in control of the game coming up into the last ten minutes, ten five minutes. So look, that's where we have to go. But we are where we are. We're in Division Three, and we're there for a reason because we didn't win enough games. Um, ultimately that comes down to me, and so we're going to have probably we're going to have with the goals when we spoke to the fellas. The fellas are probably they're very eager to right them wrongs, but we know every other other team in the. And the divisions are going to be the same. But look, our hopes for Fermanagh is probably a lot of lads get up to the standards that they got in the previous couple of years that they can do. And look, we've got a lot of a good, young, exciting talent coming through. Probably to get them. If you look at Luke Flanagan, Josh Largo, we we're probably done hard by injuries as well. We're keen to get Brandon Horn and Alton on, Alton Kellam on to the field. I think once we can get them into the field and get them embedded in, and a couple of other senior players that that probably with injuries or knocks, well, look, anything can happen, and as you've seen with Calvin Tipperary, you know you're going to really have a lot of luck, but you have to make your own luck, and uh, if we can knuckle down, work hard, anything's possible. Man, thanks for taking part. Thank you. Our next guest is Brian Wigan, a former Gaelic Life uh, columnist, but probably more famous for being a, one of the great true footballers. Um, Thanks for joining us, Brian. I wanted to get you on this week to talk about Mickey Hart because he's recently uh, stepped down from his position as throne manager and in only the past few days has taken on the role of the live manager. Um, 
but I'll, I'll avoid the loud stuff and just focus on making himself because I wanted to talk to you about a column or a piece you wrote recently or an interview you did with us recently about um, how you said that Mickey Hart helped your progression. I wonder could you explain a bit more about that? Well, as you know, I, I come into Troll Miners when I was 16 years of age, so I, I was with him three years with the Miners and um, obviously he was a young, immature lad coming in, in, into Miners and even the difference from when Mickey had me from my first year to my last year was three years and uh, you could definitely see even a big difference in, in, in me growing up f f from that time but at, at that early stage you, you would definitely have, uh, have seen how Mickey wanted to play his football, how he wanted you individually to play as a football a footballer uh, and then collectively as a team how you fitted in, into his system of play but he probably would have been the first man that would have seen me as been like a playmaker, a link man at, at that age and especially my second year in 97 um, he, he played me in the role as corner forward and just coming out and it was more or less just a free role to do, do, do as you please and it, it seemed to suit me that developed into more of a, of a set position in number 11 in, 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 my, la in my last year uh, and moving on in, into under 21s but um, definitely uh, as a footballer he, he helped me pr progress and, and be a better footballer as a person like all of us uh, at that age you know after minors he probably had faith in us to move on under 21s and then seniors and it's not so much how he helped you progress as a person, but he, he took you down the path with him in, in, in being a, a county footballer and not to go go a, a different path, which, which might have been a good path. So um, the fact that he was with us all the way, he led us all the way um, to, to, be a, to be a disciplined county footballer, I, th I think that helped me uh, as a person. I wanted to know also how you think Mickey Hart will be remembered. Obviously, Mickey should should be remembered ideally for being the first manager to to win Sam McGuire and, and Tyrone, but it's it's his legacy that he leaves behind. And I think to be fair, Mickey's got out just at the right time before before that legacy would be tarnished a bit. Um, the longer he went on, but. Not so much tarnished, because everybody, any good fo fo good football person knows knows what Mickey's about. But there is keyboard keyboard war warriors out there who who try and slander Mickey's name. And I think even this past couple of weeks, since Mickey has retired, um, left left to own senior, to own senior manager, I think a lot of people are appreciating Mickey more for for the type of person he is, and they've seen him on TV and they've seen how he spoke about. The Tyrone supporters, the as ex Tyrone players, and and GA in general, I think everybody appreciates the the man that he is. And even on BBC, the the wee cameos that he that he has appeared on already, you now can see and the outside people can can see uh, what we have seen for, for down through the years from Mickey, how knowledgeable he is, and 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 football, and how how passionate he is about the game and. I mean, like everybody would have asked you down through the years, like, well, what is Mickey like? What is he like in the changing room? And already you can see from his, his media, already you can see the type of man he is, and you can see now why a lot of his players backed him down through the years when, when a lot of outsiders who didn't know him didn't back him. Right, thanks for taking part. I'd like to welcome our columnist Shane Elliott onto the show. Thanks for joining us this week, Shane. Um, just to start, uh, I wanted to speak to you about Antrim. Looks like you're on course for the Joe McDonough final. What have you thought of Antrim this year? I've been impressed by Antrim, Ronan. Uh, they've had a good year up until now. They, they've already secured promotion to the, to the top tier. And they've had a couple of very good performances in the Joe McDonough, particularly against Kerry and, and Westmeath and Corrigan Park. They mm, they were okay against Carlo, battled back and did well to 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 get a draw out of that. But I think they'll go into the McDonough final now with every confidence that they have Kerry again. They've beaten them twice already, and I suppose 
the challenge for them will be that Croke Park will be a very do- different proposition. It's, it's just a different test of a hurler, uh, Croke Park. But bear in mind that up until the point they've been successful this year, and that's without Need McManus, and they've only had limited access to another of their, their big men, Donald Nugent. So to get the performances and the results that they have, I'm sure Darren Cleason is, is very pleased with where they're at. They're playing a nice style of hurling. I think they've been very fluid in how they're playing. They're using the ball extremely well. Their distribution into the forward line has been very good, and the, and the movement of their full forward line in particular, um, with Connor McCann and and Kieran Clark excelling in there and and always looking capable of scoring goals. Um, their half forward line have also been very good in terms of their strong runnings. You know they've Niall McKenna, James McNaughton. Uh, Michael Bradley, strong runners with the ball, can break the line and then they can create space and that's where a lot of their goals have come from. If there's any criticism of them, maybe is that they they have looked a wee bit leaky at the back themselves sometimes and that would be a bit of a worry in, in, in Croke Park for Darn because if there's one uh, if there's one venue in the, in the country that's going to expose that, it will be Croke Park because of the wide open spaces that, that, that forwards can can get and, and the chances that they can then create. So that'll be a bit of a... But I, I, I honestly think that Croke Park will suit Antrim uh, more than it'll suit Kerry um, with the style of play and the way they have been playing up until now. So I would have every confidence they'll end the year with McDonough. But I think Darren Gleeson's target at the start of the year would have been absolutely to to secure promotion to the division. He's already done that, so success in the McDonough would be a bonus at this point because it would be nice to get some silverware. But that takes you into the McCarthy, and I think Gleeson may even be thinking, you know, a year playing in the top tier of the league before going straight into the McCarthy because, as we've seen from the action so far, the, the, the standard of the Liam McCarthy teams is just exceptional actually, and I think Antrim could do with a year in the league before they, they make that step. But all in all, good year so far, yeah. In a recent piece, you said that the Down Herders of suppression, um, they were beaten uh, by Kildare in the Christian Ring final. How is that going to affect them, and how will how, what does it say about their season? The only thing that surprised me about Down, uh, Ronan, if I'm being honest, was the fact that they, that they beat... Awfully in the semi final, I think uh, that surprised everyone. I think all the pundits, uh, anyone would have made awfully a bit of a shoe in to to go forward and and, and win the Christie Ring. Um, so for them to to overcome awfully in the semi final was a bit of a surprise. Um, and then I did think they would go on to to seal the deal by by beating Kildare in the final, and they'd be very Roland Sheehan will be very very disappointed with how that played out because. Over the over the seventy minutes, I thought Down played the better hurling. I thought they were the more skillful team. I thought their use of the ball was very smart and clever. They took some lovely scores from play, particularly Pierce Oban McCrickard and 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 centre half forward, and and they 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 looked the better hurling team. Kildare were big, strong, mobile, and they proved that old analogy that goals won games. They got goals at critical times, one near the start, one near the start of the second half. And that left down always chasing the game a wee bit. And they never really looked like, finally, they got it back to a point at one stage late in the second half and then Kildare went again. So they'll be disappointed ultimately. How they'll react to it, I think it would have been good for them to go into 21 with the the ring silverware. But they have secured promotion in both league and championship. So they're up to the Joe McDonough next year and they're up to Division 2B as well. So... I think Roland Sheehan, when he's reflecting on the year that he's had, will consider that a great success. If you'd offered him that at the start of the year, I think he would have took it with both hands. The success last week actually was Donegal's win um, over Mayo in the record final. What potential does Donegal have? Yeah, Donegal, I, I, I talked about down surprising me with their success over Offaly. I think... Um, Donegal overcoming Mayo in the final was a bit of a surprise. Well, many people wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a shock, but it was a surprise because I did expect Mayo to see that one out. Mayo have been playing in the higher divisions for the last couple of years. I've seen them against um, Antrim on a couple of occasions and they had some they had some decent players and, and the fact that they were playing at the higher level thought I thought would have counted against Donegal. But Donegal surprised many uh, and, and, and how they turned it around. A couple of late goals... Um, got them, got them over the line. So, Mickey McCann and his backroom team will be very, 
satisfied with the year that they've had because that takes them up to the Christie Ring and they were in the Christie Ring last year and competed very well. I thought we're unlucky to go back down to Rackard. They're obviously at that stage where they're betwixt and between because that's they've won the Rackard now in 2018. They've won it in 2020. They're probably getting to the point where they're too good for that level and, and struggling just a wee bit at ring level. But I think the silverware secured again. They'll go into next year thinking they need to stabilise themselves. They need to stop yo-yoing up and down and, and hold themselves at ring and compete at that level for a year or two if they're truly to, to, to take themselves forward. But again, a bit like Roland Sheehan and down, Mickey McCann will be thinking that's not a bad year. We've secured the rack guard. We're up to the Christie Ring competition next year. So he'll not be, he'll not be uh, too unhappy with where it's turned out. Sheen, it's all Ireland hurling in the semi final this week. Um, I want to know which teams have stood out for you this year. Firstly, I think it's been a very entertaining championship this year. The the and the Liam McCarthy, um, in spite of the fact that you know the crowds, you maybe it's, it's dropped the intensity ever so slightly, but the skill levels and the standard I think have been really really good to watch, and it's been brilliant to have games. Uh, in the dark days of November approaching December, you know, it's been great every weekend to have hurling action to watch. You know, the last two or three weekends have been have been just a, a, a joy. Um, in terms of who's impressed, obviously the four teams who are now in the semi-final, Limerick, Galway, Waterford and Kilkenny have impressed and deserve to be where they are. Limerick, to me, are just uh, the, the Harlem Globetrotters of hurling at time. With ball in hand, I don't think there's a better team. I think this is a Limerick side that's capable of winning back-to-back All-Irelands and going on to get five or six. I think they are that good. But it's not easy. It's saying that they have the potential to do that. But as you see from, from Kilkenny, and again, anyone who's read my column will know my admiration for Kilkenny over the years. Um, and, and Brian Cody's desire continues to shine through in the teams that he produces. Um, you know, we saw that against Galway in the Leinster final, where I, I I thought Galway would have would have would have taken that game and taken it reasonably comfortably, but Kilkenny just never go away. And while Galway may have looked superior in terms of their stick work and even their physicality and size, Kilkenny just cannot. Or they just never lie down. They keep going. They keep going, and they have an uncanny knack of scoring goals at the right time. And you with players like T.J. Reid and the the great Richie Hogan coming on and showing scoring one of the goals of the decade they have still the real potential to go forward and, and take an All-Ireland and Limerick if Limerick get into the final and get over Galway in the semi I, I think the last team they'll want to see is Kilkenny because they are just so dogged and hard to hard to beat Galway I, I thought at the start of the year they would be ones to watch I think the match up with them and Limerick because what Galway is capable of is is matching Limerick physically and that's a that's important because the Limerick have some massive units, as do as do Galway. So that'll be an interesting because they will match Limerick physically. Uh, and in Connor Whelan, I think they have a candidate for hurler of the year. He's just been exceptional in 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 the Galway forward line. So the Galway Limerick, if I have to go for it, I have to go for Limerick, Kilkenny and Waterford. I, my admiration for Kilkenny might say that I I would go that way, but I've also been very impressed by Waterford. The, in both the performance against Clare and in the Monster final against Limerick and I think what Liam Cahill has brought to them they were always hard to beat they were always hard to break down because they played that sweeper system and had perfected that under Derek McGrath but they still hadn't worked out that transition because they, they wouldn't have put up enough scores but I think what Liam Cahill has brought to them is a real real scoring threat and with Desi Hutchinson flying in the corner and them getting the right ball into them I I just think Kilkenny could be up against it um, Waterford are more than capable of turning them over in, in, in Croke Park with the style they play but my heart would still say it'll be a Kilkenny-Limerick final but let's see it could go either way Shane thanks for taking part appreciate it Okay, that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. And if you want more of this content, I encourage you to subscribe to the digital edition of Gaelic Life. I mean, get it online. We've got a PDF edition and a website. And you can even get the app now too, which is just newly out, just fresh out of the box. So I encourage you to do that. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you again very soon.